So our topic today is BIM, which is Building Information Modeling, Management and Modeling. Uh, the, this has been around in industry for a long time. People have been knowing about this. Software has been developing. They've been plugging it in and out of different uh, energy modeling, other softwares, lots of other things that can go in and out of BIM. Different, different software um, companies are developing this, and it's, it's up and growing. Um, and so today, um, you know, what are the opportunities we have with BIM? What are the tools and information uh, that we can keep using within the BIM products to help us develop more energy efficient buildings, furthering the green building practice, having smooth transitions between disciplines, buildings and green buildings to our clients. Uh, Josh uh, is currently with a SHW Group uh, in Austin, Texas. He's a job captain and project designer. Josh has a, a Bachelor's of Science in Architecture from UT at Arlington and a Master's of Architecture from the University of Houston. Well, I want to thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to be here. Um, this project was very unique uh, for SHW Group in the fact uh, that we had an opportunity to work at a, a premier high school within the district, uh, but also to uh, really experiment with the Austin Green Building Program. Uh, we hadn't done a lot of work within the program because uh, our firm mainly focuses on schools uh, and we do a lot of work outside of Austin. Uh, but this was our first opportunity to really get hands in, uh, hands on with uh, the Austin Green Building Program uh, in the district uh, to provide a high performing uh, school. Uh, this particular project was a part of uh, McCallum High School, uh, but it was an addition that was added as a part of the 2009 bond package. Um, in that addition, uh, we were tasked to provide uh, three new science classrooms as well as the theater. Uh, McCallum High School is a, a fine arts magnet for the district. Uh, they provide a lot of fine arts programs um, that are very specialized. Uh, they had an existing theater on campus, uh, but they were looking to do a full fly loft theater that would provide the full gamut of theater of arts uh, performance as well as uh, programs related to that. Um, like I said, the project came true uh, in 2009 as part of, as part of the uh, bond package. Uh, it started in 2010 uh, in design and was completed in September of 2011 uh, with the completion of the uh, Five Star Green Building uh, Energy Rating. Um, the client's goals and expectations were for us to not only deliver a high performing school, school on budget, on schedule, all of those things, uh, but they also gave us a little challenge uh, in the fact that the district did uh, have a mandate that all of the schools and all the buildings that they do must meet the two star uh, rating under the Austin Ener Energy Green Building Program. Uh, but they had actually challenged us to meet a four star uh, because the previous school, Lanier High School, had just completed a, uh, an addition for a theater that received a four star. Um, so we were kind of prodded from the very beginning uh, to get the four star and uh, we actually took on the challenge to try to achieve a five star uh, from our project manager, Tony Silver with the Austin ISD. Uh, he wanted to go above and beyond. So from the very beginning of the project, we had buy-in from the owner, we had buy-in uh, from the project team. Uh, we had a great team uh, working with us uh, that were completely all in from the very beginning as far as what it was gonna take to get to the five star rating. Um, how did we approach the project? The project was um, challenging in a way because the, uh, the two programs that we were dealing with were science programs. Uh, we were tasked to build three new science classrooms as a part of the changing uh, TEA requirements and we had a theater arts program. Uh, and traditionally, the district wanted us to put both of those programs in the same building. Um, McCallum High School was built in the 50s. It's a very sprawling campus, uh, one story. There are programs all over the place. Um, so we looked at that as a challenge of how can we put these two programs into this school uh, and get the best, best bang for the buck as well as provide the best opportunities for the standalone theater building that we were gonna be building. Um, it just so happened that in the existing school, uh, there, were, as a, there was a science wing uh, in, the, in the school that also housed three art classrooms uh, across the, the hallway from the science classrooms. Uh, so we actually took a kind of innovative approach and said, well, what if we take those three art classrooms, we pull those programs out of the school, we put them in this theater building and we'll build three new science classrooms within the existing building uh, that is also in direct relationship and connection to the existing science program. Um, the district loved the idea. Uh, it was actually proven through our contractor that it would save a little bit of money on the project by doing that. Uh, and it allowed us to have an opportunity to build a standalone building on the campus that would house art and theater, which are more directly related programs, um, and also would help us in achieving some of the green building standards that we were trying to achieve for that project without adding all that science program uh, into it. 
Uh, and once again, the client's goals and expectations were exactly what I said. They were, it was the, the budget, the schedule, everything, as well as the, the four-star rating uh, in, energy, in the uh, energy green building program. Um, this is a front perspective of the building when it was completed. Um, one of the biggest challenges that we, re we had with this project, if you're familiar with the high school, is that uh, Sunshine Drive, which is the main drive that runs in front of the school, uh, backs up to a neighborhood. So there's a neighborhood on the other side of the school. Um, there's not a whole lot of room on the site. There's not a lot of space to put uh, anything um, of this magnitude. Uh, with a theater, uh, you're dealing with a 70-foot fly tower that has to carry and handle all the scenery and everything from a theater arts program. Um, so you have a very tall structure and a one-story kind of campus. Um, and how do you kind of build that into the context without it just being this big, giant thing sitting in the middle of this, uh, this site? Um, so from a design standpoint, we really kind of looked at how can we bring the scale of this thing down. It helped a lot with uh, uh, actually reducing the amount of square footage as well as the volume that we were building within the space. Also gave you more of a human scale from the front. Uh, whereas you can get a glimpse of what's going on in the back and you're not hit so hard with those big tall volumes uh, as you're dealing uh, with the theater program. Uh, this was a picture of the uh, interior of the theater. Um, kind of translated a lot of the things that the Green Building Program um, champions. Uh, a lot of materials that we used were very sustainable, uh, very limited. Uh, trying to keep things as, uh, as easy, not only for the district from a maintenance standpoint, but also uh, more sustainable and, and less, um, more environmental friendly uh, from a material standpoint for us. Um, the uh, seating was for 500 people, uh, so it wasn't a large theater. Uh, actually to our advantage for this project is because it is a theater, it typically doesn't have a lot of windows, there's not a lot of glazing that actually uh, comes into the building. Um, so that actually gave us an opportunity to really save money on energy um, for this project. So how did BIM uh, aid us in the process of completing the project goals and achieving our sustainability goals? Um, I want to focus really on this project, uh, not so much on the design side of how we use BIM in the design process, but how we use BIM as a, as a team to complete the project in a very uh, efficient way, but also in a way that we could make sure that we could achieve the five-star uh, rating. Uh, fortunately enough for us, we were able to have a, a seam at risk on job Flintco um, constructive solutions. So from the very beginning of the project, we knew who our CM was going to be. Uh, we were able to uh, talk to them and really work through a lot of the ideas and the things that uh, were challenges for the project and try to find innovative solutions on how we could achieve our goals, uh, but also use BIM as a software of, of communication between the team. Um, the uh, mechanical engineer was HMG. Our structural engineer was JQ, Jasper Quintanilla here in Austin. Uh, we all decided that we were going to use Revit. Uh, for the project. Uh, we were all in Revit and we would use the advantages of BIM uh, to actually communicate and uh, alleviate issues within the project. So uh, for us, BIM came, became more of just you know, 3D modeling. Uh, typically when everything moves into to the BIM, it's about 3D modeling and visualizing things and seeing how the building reacts and, and uh, works on a site as well as doing daylight studies solar studies and those things uh, that are all built within the software. But we actually took it a step further and how can we actually use it to alleviate, alleviate issues uh, in the project when it gets into construction. Um, because we were very tight, we were trying to receive a five-star rating. Uh, we were dealing with a very constrictive program. Uh, we knew that we would need to get every point that we could get. Um, there were some restrictions with the school district as far as energy was concerned. Um, so we couldn't have mishaps in the field. Uh, mishaps could cost us two or three points, and those two or three points could mean a five-star rating. Um, so what we did is we used BIM to actually uh, run clash detections to coordinate between our consultants so that we could talk to each other about those issues. Uh, we could visualize and see how those different systems in the building would actually integrate into the project, uh, and then ultimately make decisions and make corrections uh, that would alleviate the problems in the field. Um, our team was an integrated design process with SHW, HMG, and JQ. Um, from the very beginning, like I said, we were um, focused on, on communicating and doing an integrative design process. It's, a, it's kind of a new um, thing that's being pushed in the architectural community as far as integrated design. It deals not only with you know, communication and them, but also energy modeling. How do you uh, do prescriptive energy modeling as well as comparative energy modeling and then make adjustments and changes as needed. Uh, not just verifying how your building's performing, but taking those energy models and using them as information uh, to, for the project team to make adjustments uh, so that you can achieve your goals. 
and don't get down into CDs and later in the design process or in the construction process and then quickly trying to make adjustments when you don't have time or the budget. Uh, this was a picture of the model uh, from Revit. Uh, this integrates the structural, the MEP, as well as the architecture. Um, this is a picture of the structure and the architectural uh, portions of the project. So uh, we started with this part of it. We kind of got the building designed, uh, got everything into the computer as far as what we were thinking, got depths and all those things for structure, and then integrated into the, uh, the MEP part of it. Uh, this shows the MEP portion of it. I'm sorry, uh, you can't see it very well. The, the building is ghosted in there, but uh, you can only really see the MEP part of it. Um, but we worked with our MEP engineers to work through those design processes. They modeled all the major elements of the project, uh, ductwork, um, runs of any kind, all of our returns, uh, locations of, of grills, everything. So that when we were working through the project, we could see where these things were going to be. We would work through them architecturally, visually, so that we would make sure that things weren't falling in places we didn't want them to. But also looking at how does that integrate with structure? Uh, where does that interfere? We don't want ductwork running through um, our structure, beams, columns, and the like. Um, and we definitely didn't want to have issues with a, an element uh, here. Um, this is a, a piece of ductwork that we actually put into the project that runs underneath the, um, the seats. And that was kind of an innovative uh, approach to the HVAC that we took on this project. Uh, traditionally, everything's run from above and brought down to you. Uh, but we felt that in order to meet the energy goals that we needed for this project, we would have to deliver air from underneath. It would allow us to cool the audience at the feet, and then the hot air would rise so that we're not trying to push cold air down through the warm air. Uh, that actually was a significant savings on our energy for the project. Uh, but it was a challenge. Uh, running a large duck underneath seats is not the easiest thing. For one, our units were up on the roof. The transitions of the duct work down to uh, through the, the hardest part of the, the building, which is this backside where everything's coming in, had to transition down and then come through and be delivered out to the audience. So there was a lot of coordination that had to happen between not only the mechanical engineer, but also our structural engineer as well as our contractor and how that would be phased and would be built uh, out in the field. Um, so then once we got through design, it was all about the integrated design pro process with the construction team. So SHW and Flintco, we had a lot of meetings uh, trying to go through the design process and how we were designing this project and ultimately how it would be built um, and trying to alleviate some of those issues that we would have. Uh, this is one of the biggest advantages of CM at risk. And in my experience as an architect, it's not always there for you. Uh, CM at risk is used a lot, but you don't always have the cooperation of a contractor or the knowledge of a contractor on board. Uh, to really go after those uh, opportunities that arise as far as being efficient and uh, delivering a project uh, without as many issues. Um, this was our class detection. So this is what the MEP was using. Uh, so it, it works within Revit, uh, within the environment. But one of the biggest things that I can stress about class detection is to have regular meetings. Um, we were having regular meetings uh, to go over these issues. So everybody would run a class detection to see when problems are arising. So here, as you can see, we've got issues with the structure and the duct work, uh, as well as some uh, of the mechanical equipment in the building. Uh, it runs it within the environment of Revit. It tells you where these issues are, are occurring. Uh, you can then go in and pinpoint those problems and then make corrections uh, for those problems uh, so that you don't get out in the field and somebody's already put in the structure and then, oh, now I've got to figure out how to get this duct work and this mechanical uh, units in there. Um, in construction, this was a huge help, uh, and this was a, actually where I think it's the biggest help is you're not necessarily building things and then tearing them out. Uh, from a sustainability standpoint, how many times you go in and you build something and it doesn't quite work? Uh, somebody's got to come in and they got to tear out half of what you just did. That goes to the trash, and you got to bring in new stuff. So um, it helps with your diversion of materials to the waste, as well as uh, providing a, a more timely schedule for the project, so you're not having to correct these issues uh, as you're going through. It allowed us to visualize, especially from the model to the built uh, in the field uh, conditions. So our contractors were able to really look at our model uh, and understand exactly what was happening in a 3D fashion uh, so that they'd know exactly how it was supposed to be built in the field, uh, more so than what you get with 2D drawings. Um, so the design is finished. So how do we make sure all this gets, construction, gets constructed and uh, we meet all the requirements? Uh, the integrated design or construction process with the construction team was the integral into this. Uh, after we had released the drawings, uh, we released all of our models. Uh, and this has been a point of contention in the architectural field is what do you do with these BIM models once you finish them? 
uh, as far as design, as far as integrating them into the construction process and allowing the contractor to use uh, your models. Uh, but what we did, I'm sorry, what we did is we gave them all of our models. Uh, they took our Revit models and they imported it into Navisworks. And they used Navisworks for a number of activities from a construction standpoint. But the biggest thing that they were able to use it for was to actually distribute those models to the subcontractors. Uh, the subcontractors would then take the models, they would then refine them, because uh, just because we designed something doesn't mean that's how it's going to get built in the field. Uh, and they would also put in more detail, uh, things that we don't normally design as architects or even the mechanical or electrical uh, engineers, um, to check for further clashes. Uh, once the fire pipes and everything get laid in, uh, maybe there's some different things that are changed through the design process. You've got VE processes that are happening. So in a very short period of time, um, of between bidding and, and the start of construction, um, you can really get after and try to find some of these issues when you're being items or you're making changes to reduce the scope or the price of a project uh, and get your subcontractors to go ahead and make those changes. They make those changes, the contractor gets all those changes back, uh, they compare the models, uh, they run through uh, their class detection uh, in Navisworks. So here, as you can see with these, these two items here, this is where Firepipe was running through um, some issues. So this is running through an angle on the bottom, so a structural angle that it was interfering with, and then some fire pipe is running through a beam. Uh, in the traditional construction process, what would happen is that, you know, they would design it, they'd go out and try to build it, and then something would get changed in the field and you never know what's going to happen. Um, one of the biggest challenges that we have with green building is the fact that things change in the field and they don't always get documented in the project. Um, this helps alleviate some of those changes that could occur and allows you to at least have a little bit of control over how those changes are, are addressed, uh, particularly when it becomes uh, issues with uh, low VOC uh, materials. Uh, oftentimes, the, uh, the construction team will be working on something and somebody will need to quickly go get something and they'll just go get something off the shelf at, at Home Depot or Lowe's and it doesn't meet the specifications of the project as far as those low VOC contents or recycled contents. And so you're not really delivering a project that you say you're delivering. Uh, it may be minute, but um, it helps alleviate some of those issues. So Navisworks class detection, the, the contractor did all of this. Uh, we had regular meetings during construction on this portion of the project. Um, we were there merely as just a, you know, knowing what's going on and if there was issues that arose within architectural or MEP design that we would help uh, give a direction as far as that was concerned. Uh, and then another thing that I wanted to add, this is kind of beyond BIM and it's becoming a bigger deal uh, within the architecture community is, is digital submittals. Um, as I keep talking about this, this is all about communication. Uh, this is all about working with your project team and trying to alleviate problems in the field. Uh, but we use digital submitt submittals uh, to coordinate with the Austin Green Building Program as well as our consultants and contractors uh, in order to make sure that everybody knew exactly what was expected. Um, it allowed us to do things in a more timely manner. Um, we use uh, Newforma Project Center to do all of that and it's actually progressed since we did this project uh, to integrate more of the, the construction process um, where you can share your models through it uh, with your contractor. Um, you can share information uh, more readily available. So uh, with the Austin Green Building Program, uh, where they check submittals, they make sure that the things that we say we're doing, we're doing. Uh, it allows us to transfer that information back and forth quickly. It allows us to track uh, where we are in stages. So when a submittal comes out, uh, we can come back and, uh, and and uh, know that that needs to be rechecked and it doesn't get thrown off to the wayside or gets forgotten about. Um, it allows us to track every submittal and every process of the, of the construction process uh, to make sure that we're meeting the goals that we were expecting to reach. Uh, this is just a, a little uh, screenshot from Newforma. So it's got a full list of all the submittals, RFIs, everything that's a part of the construction process, but it allows you to track all those things so that you can know where things are standing. Um, if there's issues, say you've got a submittal and there's something that wasn't correct, as far as recycled content, you can mark that up. It knows that that's what you're waiting for so that when you get that submittal back from the contractor, that's the item that you're looking for. So there's no guessing. Uh, it allows the whole project team to, to know what's going on. So if somebody jumps in and needs to check something, they can go back and look at the log and know exactly what's missing and what needs to be addressed uh, within that portion of the submittal. Um, and there were some other tools that are available to project teams. So some of these I want to just quickly go over um, are some that have become available since we did this project and we currently use on other projects in our, in our office. Um, one of them is the Revit Conceptual Energy Analysis uh, that's built into Revit. Uh, it's also known as Project Versari, which is another piece of software that Autodesk is using uh, to do energy analysis. But this software 
allows you to analyze your buildings on a conceptual basis. So you build massing models, similar to what you would do in SketchUp. And uh, you can analyze those by putting in systems and getting general energy data about your projects. Uh, what it allows you to do is more comparative modeling rather than true whole building analysis, but it allows you to compare slight subtleties or changes in design uh, to other versions. So if you wanted to analyze how a solar system was working on the facade of a building, you could compare those apples to apples. You're not really looking at the true data that it's, it's providing to you, um, but you're looking at the differences between the data so that you know which, data, which version of the design is, is working better or more to your advantage. Uh, as well as material takeoffs in Revit. And this is a new tool that, that I don't think it's used by most teams uh, as much as it probably could be used. Um, not necessarily for giving to the contractor, but actually tracking how your materials are being used on your project. Um, so as you're in design uh, and you're curious how much recycled content is in your project or you're curious how much regional content might be in your project, uh, and you're trying to meet those goals and you're really just going off of experience, you're going, you know, I've done two or three, four projects and They've had about 40% regional content, maybe 15% recycled content. This is a way to actually track that uh, within all the bells and whistles of the software as far as what it allows you to do as far as materials are concerned. You can actually attach numbers to those things and then run calculations to get a general idea. It's not that that's exactly what's going to be because obviously during the bidding process things get changed uh, and materials might be slightly different. But it gives you an idea of where you stand so that there's no guessing uh, and crossing your fingers at the end of the construction process saying, am I going to make it, am I going to make it, uh, or trying to find something to put in the building uh, to make you get to, the, to those, uh, those points. Uh, and this was final slide, just, uh, just kind of want to talk just a little bit about the, the things that we did on this project. Um, the site was, could be a point of contention for this project, but we actually used it as an opportunity. Um, the site, because of the, the sprawling nature of the school, there's not a lot of um, opportunities to work with the site, but we did go back in and try to do some reworking of some of the stormwater management systems that were on the site, as well as introduce more native landscaping. So all out front of the school, you know, this was very difficult to convince uh, Austin ISD to do, but to put more landscaping rather than just grass and hardscape. Um, so if you drive by the school, you'll see a lot of landscaping trees, a lot of natural vegetation, all native and adaptive for the school around the site, uh, as well as an outdoor learning center, um, or I'm sorry, an outdoor learning environment on the art side of the, uh, of the building that allows students to go out and work in, within the uh, natural environment um, and enjoy some of that landscaping that's available to them. Um, we use cool roofs on all this project, so you know, white reflective roofs on the, on the building, uh, used very light materials, so the metal panels were very light and trying to reduce our heat island on the job. Um, I talked a little bit about the underfloor air delivery, so kind of a unique opportunity with uh, reducing our energy usage on the building as well as providing um, more comfortable HVAC to the, uh, to the audience, as well as air quality. Uh, we did everything in our power to reduce uh, VOCs on materials, paints, um, everything in the job to try to get maximize the learning environment uh, that would be best for the students. Um, and ultimately, we received uh, the five star with a few points extra, so it actually worked out great. I think we got just about every point that we were striving for, and I can really attribute that to this process that we use during design and construction. Uh, using BIM, communicating with our client, communicating with our contractor and our project team, and ultimately delivering a project uh, that would be best for Austin ISD. So that's all I have. Thank you. <laughs>